But you may uh, look around you, you may find a few less people sitting beside you. That is because right now as we speak, our team is in Arizona right now ministering to the natives and the uh, Congolese or African refugees up in the camp. And I heard a report yesterday that the number was up to 150. If you don't know what that means, that means there's about 100 and probably over 115 crazy teenagers with so many different complexities going on. So I talked to Blake and he was just like, man, there's so many moving parts uh, but the team that we have sent is an incredible group from our church, and I know they are ministering right now and already tired, okay? So they need our prayers, they need our support, and so please just continue to remember them throughout this week, because as you're going to bed and nestling into society, you know, your nice warm covers and blankets, and they're in like this twin mattress and mice-infested cabins and, you know, serving God on our behalf, and so just uh, please keep them in our prayers. And I do want to take some time just to say thank you. And, you know, we've sent that team and they're going to go and they're going to serve in that way. But also we've had so many from our church that has partnered with that ministry by giving to the Arizona missions offering. And we took up over $12,000 in support of this camp. It's incredible. I, I mean, after I heard this number and after I just seen your generosity, even through our, our Jerry project, that Project Pakistan that we've been working on, and then, you know, the missions offering to Arizona, I just sat there in my office this week thinking, what an honor. What a privilege it is to be here during this time at First Baptist and to serve such generous people like you. And so I find it a true privilege. But if you want to join me this morning, I would love to just take a moment and just pray for our friends in Arizona. Pray that God would move mightily in their hearts this week. So pray with me before we get started this morning. God, we are so thankful. God, we are so thankful that, that you have just opened up this ministry, that you have made a way for us to to go to a different part of our country, to minister to a very different people. Lord, a people who need you, a people who often have been neglected, a people who have often have been lo looked over or ignored or mistreated. But God, I thank you for opening up their hearts enough to will willingly to let us come there, God, to share the hope of the scripture, to share your son with them. And God, I pray for our team right now. I know this is a very challenging trip. Now, there's so many complexities that are involved. It, it, it's so many difficulties in doing this, but God, I pray you would give them wisdom. God, give them guidance. God, fill them with the spirit that they're able to teach and they're able to proclaim your truths with clarity. And I pray for the students, God, you would already right now begin to prepare people's hearts to receive you. God, we know this can be a very powerful week as these students are exposed to the gospel for the first time in many cases and I pray that you would make your gospel so clear in their minds. God, convict their hearts. I pray that miracles could happen this week, that we would see dead people come to life. God, you have the power to do that, and we call on you for that. So God, we pray this and we give it all to you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, thank you for taking that time with me. All right, so if you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 2. We're going to be in Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42 today. We're continuing our series on the 12 characteristics of a healthy church. Now, we've looked at several in the past, but today we are going to focus on the characteristic of biblical fellowship. Biblical fellowship. It's almost like a part two message from last week as we talked about church membership. This sort of goes hand in hand. There's so many uh, characteristics that kind of uh, play into each other. And this is one that plays really well into church membership. And it's why it's made its way into this week. But fellowship, the essential question that we're going to ask, and hopefully you're able to pick up a sermon sheet in the bulletin. If you haven't, in the weeks to come, please uh, make use of that. We, we attach some notes inside there that gives you an opportunity to really engage with the text and engage what I'm saying in a different way. So the essential question that we want to ask today is how can you, how can you increase our church's health in relation to biblical fellowship? There are many things throughout this series that's, that's corporate, that we gather together, but, but when we're talking about this aspect of fellowship, there's a very personal nature to this that you have the power and the ability to change our church's health as we talk about this characteristic of fellowship. If you're still turning there, I want to share a few things with you just to kind of prep our mind on where we're going. I want to take you for, for a moment back to a time during COVID. 
Now, I know for many of us, you're like, really? Can we just forget that whole side of our life and act like it never happened? That's what I do usually. But for a moment, I want to take us back there because I don't know if you remember, but when COVID first came out, we all had to isolate. And I don't know if you felt this or not, but at first it was like, hey, this is not too bad. You know, it was kind of nice to retreat from the world. You know, in the jobs that we have, you're around people and, and things are going all the time. And so just to be forced to take a step back and to really just, you know, isolate with your family, it was like, ah, oh, this is kind of nice. But if you remember the progression, it wasn't too long that we became a little tired of it. You know, after a couple of weeks, you're like, okay, now what? <laughs> okay, that was a really good break. But now what? So we grew kind of tired of it. And then before long, we became resentful of it. We're like, I hate this isolation. Let's get out in society again. Let's go out there. And then I don't know if you, if you followed it even further in this progression, but we, we began to see how it affected our society. This isolation really turned things upside down. Even in our schools, I noticed it so much in our schools, in our workplaces, like, like society was different because of the isolation that we faced. Recent studies have shown that the isolation brought on by COVID has contributed to a substantial increase in anxiety and depression. Check these statistics out. 50% of our nation suffered from increased anxiety, and a third of our country reported high levels of depression, specifically as it was associated with isolation. COVID, I don't think, is our only experience with isolation. So we're going to set COVID aside. Okay, you can go back to forgetting that ever happened. We have this thing in prisons called solitary confinement. This is another example in our society where I believe we, we, we are faced with, with solitary confinement. And we can actually do studies on this. And this is what one of the studies said. Premature deaths by suicide, homicide, or opioid overdose after release from prison are more likely for those that spent any amount of time, even one day, in solitary confinement than those who have never experienced solitary confinement. And I don't know if you've ever experienced solitary confinement here. That would be really fun if you could come up to me afterwards and be like, yeah, I spent a few days in solitary. That would be an interesting conversation. But for most of us, we're going to have to take their word for it. Both John McCain and Nelson Mandela said that all the horrors of prison that they faced, solitary confinement was the worst. If we move on to another example, has anybody ever heard of Mr. Beast? Everyone under 40 at least, maybe. I don't know. Uh, I, I thought my kids would be really impressed with me that I was going to be preaching about Mr. Beast today. And they were really trying to figure out how Mr. Beast made it into an actual sermon. But if you don't know, Mr. Beast is a very popular YouTuber. When I say very popular YouTuber, I'm talking a very popular YouTuber, so much so that he makes millions of dollars making videos on YouTube. That's a whole different story that we can talk about some other time. But nonetheless, he does these experiments all the time. And, you know, they're trying to, to create very fun experiments so that people watch their videos. But I happened to watch one of their experiments the other day, and it was that Mr. Beast was going to lock himself in solitary confinement for seven days, completely removed from society. And this is the room that he locked himself in, completely white, soft surfaces like this for seven days without any contact to the outside world or any kind of stimuli within this room. And if you saw this episode... He survived, but it wasn't very pretty. It wasn't the normal like, hey, I'm having fun during this experiment. It really affected him. They actually had a psychologist there on site because they were afraid that even in this seven-day stretch that it was going to permanently affect his psychological health. Mr. Beast had done other experiments where he was actually buried alive for seven days. He could still main maintain contact with the outside world. But after he did this experiment, he compared the two and he said it was far worse to be locked in solitary confinement than actually being buried alive. What is this speaking to us through COVID, through studies on confinement, through experimentation? I think we can see a certain common pattern here that we as humans, we are designed as creatures who need community. We are not designed to live in isolation. It actually works against the fabric of who we were created to be. And if you think about it, after all, we are made in the image of God. And when you consider the Trinitarian essence of who God is, it only makes sense. That is this communion that exists between Father, Son, and Spirit, and then we are, we are created in that image that we would desire and crave communion. 
So in light of these realities, I wanted us to turn our eyes and our ears to the scriptures today to see what God has to say about community and take notice of how important fellowship is, not only to our created beings, but also to the church that he has designed. And so that's why we chose Acts chapter 2. We're going to read in verse 42 today. This is what it says. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking of bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Pray with me, church. Now, we're so thankful for your word. We are so thankful that we have a recorded example of what your early church was like, an example that we can look to, God, to form our church today upon. So thank you for giving us this. Thank you for preserving it through history that we can learn and grow from today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever been a part of a very powerful movement of God? I don't know if you've, if you've been a part of this, you're going to kind of understand where I'm going with this. But if you've been a part of this kind of like revival movement, a very strong movement of God, to see people turn their hearts to God in large numbers, to see people who you would never imagine care anything about God at all, lay their hearts on the altar and confess their sins. And it's a very powerful thing. When I was in middle school, high school, I saw a few of these. There was a really large revival that went on at Trace Creek and in, in it was like a youth revival where like as a youth, like there were so many of my peers that would gather at Trace Creek and this revival went on for days. It wasn't just like a week long revival. I can't even remember it now. In my mind, it was like years it went on, but probably it was like a few months. But every night we would gather for worship and you just couldn't wait to actually go to church. I mean, think about this as a middle schooler. I couldn't wait to go to church to see what God was going to do. I remember the feeling of excitement and just this anticipation to see the Spirit miraculously change. It was like, who is He going to save tonight? It was just such an exciting time as I think back. And as a church camp, as a young one, as, I, as a young one, that sounds like I'm like an old guy or something. Wow. As a youth at church camp, there we go. Um, I remember these powerful movements of God that you, you literally felt the Spirit's movement upon the group there in such powerful ways. And He was calling people to ministry. He was calling people to salvation it was just such an interesting time to be a part of. If you've ever been a part of this, you can understand where I'm going with this, that it's something that you want to desire. It's something that you want to be a part of. But no matter how much we experienced back in the day, I cannot imagine what it must have been like for our context here in our scriptures. The people were literally seeing the world turn upside down. Right before our passage in verse 41, it says that 3,000 souls on that one day came to Christ and repented and received Christ for salvation. 3,000. What would that be like in our community to see 3,000 people come to know Christ in one day? It would be, I mean, insane. And then towards the end of that verse, in verse 47, it says, God was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. So think about this movement that they were a part of, that they saw this, this large group of people come to know Christ, and then every day they were seeing people confess Christ as Savior, it must have been an incredible time. And so I, as I think back to this movement, I, and I look at my experience that I had in middle school and high school, and I thought, man, how amazing would it be for us to be a part of a similar type movement? And then you think, okay, well, what made this movement happen? And I know for, for many times in the scriptures, there's, this was a very special and unique time. I get that. You know, the Spirit was poured out in a very miraculous way on the day of Pentecost. I understand that. But also, there's, there's something in my, in my mind that wants me to look back and think, okay, what was going on during that church at that time that led to such an incredible movement of God? And then we fast forward 2,000 years, and I think, okay, how can our church participate in some of those same ingredients, follow their example in similar ways in order to usher in this movement of God 
today. I don't think that's unrealistic. One night I was uh, wanting to make some brownies, okay? You got any brownies fans out there? Some Betty Crocker fudge brownies in Walmart, they're pretty good. I don't know what they put in that sack, but it's some good stuff, okay? Some good ingredients. But as I was looking on the ingredients list, you know, you, you got, you know, I don't even know now because it's been a while since I made them, but I know there's eggs in there. I think there's some, some water and then there's oil, all right? So it was like late at night one night, I was wanting to make these brownies and this is when we lived out in the county, you know, before the DGs were everywhere, okay? All right, you couldn't just go to the DG, you had to go to Walmart still. It was like 20 minute drive. I'm like, I don't want to go to Walmart. So I looked for all the ingredients. I was missing one ingredient, oil. So I've been to think, man, I really want some brownies. What can I replace this ingredient with to still make these brownies taste pretty good? So I pulled up a Google online article because, you know, that's the source of all things that we need. And it told me that I could replace my oil with applesauce. You guys ever heard of this? I was like, applesauce. That sounds weird, but it's Google, right? It's got to be right. So I made these brownies, whipped them up with some applesauce instead of oil. I can report to you today that that is a lie. <laughs> you cannot replace oil with applesauce and get the same product as you can with oil. I don't care what they say. You create something, but it's a distorted picture of the original design. If you're with me here, if you want to follow me out, what I'm trying to say here is there are certain ingredients that the church had during this time. And I believe that we, if we exercise in these same ingredients, we can produce similar products. But if we try to replace the ingredients with other ingredients, we create a product, but it can turn out to be a distorted product from the original design or what God intended it to be. And so I really want to focus in this morning and look, what are these ingredients of the early church? What was going on during this time that led to such powerful Movements. And in our text, if you go back to verse 42, there are four major things that they were focused on. In verse 42, it just comes out of the gate and says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. And as we look at those four, as we survey those, I think we may feel like the fellowship is not really that important of a characteristic. You know, if we, if maybe you thought even that today as we come to our text, you're like fellowship, yeah, like missions, discipleship, evangelism. Yes, those are grand, like important things as we look on the characteristics of our church. And then when we come to this aspect of fellowship, you may be thinking, fellowship, is that really like one of the 12? I didn't even know that would be a 12. But as we look back on the early church, as they reported on four major ingredients of their church, fellowship was one of these ingredients. The word here is koinonia, if you've ever heard this word used a lot. Koinonia really means just a community or a partnership. John Piper, he had a definition for Christian fellowship, and I kind of enjoy that. He says this, he defined it as this, Christian fellowship is a mutual bond that Christians have with Christ, uniting us to him, which involves us in a profound, deep, eternal relationship of love with each other. Christian fellowship, koinonia. It almost means that like you're a, you're a stakeholder in the company. You own a share in the company. You have a vested interest in a particular relationship. As we survey our community, I think, I think we can realize that there are communities that we are involved in even today. I'm learning that there's a, uh, I picked up tennis over the last year or so. We're really enjoying the, the game of tennis. I never really played it growing up, but there's actually a tennis community. I didn't even know this. Or if you play golf out there, you kind of realize that there's like a golfing community. And if you go to the Y, you kind of understand that there's like a weightlifting community. What, what makes these things communities? As I got to thinking about it, you're participating with these people Together, you, you have a very shared interest and your lives cross over because you're doing these things that you love usually at the same time. And so naturally, you make bonds with these different people who share your same common interest. Others outside of the community, they don't necessarily understand life inside the community. I would love to share with you an example to kind of help you understand this. Whether you realize this or not, I don't know. I think I might have shared this to you, but I'm a huge fan of dirt bike racing. I know. It sounds kind of weird, right? I used to race dirt bikes growing up, and I used to be a huge fan. Then, 
But then I, you know, I became an adult. My parents made me stop racing. Still a little bitter about that, by the way. Uh, but anyways, too many hospital bills, I guess. You know, who, you know I don't really remember. <laughs> anyways, so this dirt bike racing was a, a very important to me growing up. But then I, I, when I didn't watch it for a long time. And then in Abu Dhabi or when we were in Dubai, we had a chance to go see a Supercross race at one of the arenas there. And I fell in love with it all over again. I was like, this is awesome. These are my people. Like, I understood it. It was so great. And so if there was somebody in here today that said, you know what, I'm a dirt bike racing fan as well, me and you would instantly have a bond because I would want to talk to you about what's happening in the dirt bike racing community right now. But as I'm saying this, now, don't lie to me. As I'm saying this, there's some of you right now that's like, really? Dirt bike racing? Like, that sounds, first of all, so redneck. And then I don't get it. There's communities if you're not a part of, you would not get it. If I started telling you some of the things about dirt bike, dirt bike racing community, you would not enjoy yourselves, right? I can tell you, it just, would just be boring to you. Maybe an illustration you might understand that, that kind of helps you understand maybe the communities that you're a part of. What about football? We got any football fans in here? Okay, now we're talking, right? Let's go. See, I did this on purpose because sometimes you don't even realize the community that you're a part of, because everyone around you is almost in that same community. And so when it comes to football, you have a lot of people that are inside of that community. And so you get each other. If you've ever been to like an NFL game or, or even some of the high school games, I don't know that there's any greater picture of community and fellowship as it comes to football and our culture. If you think about it, you show up hours before the actual event. Where else do you do that, right? You're always like, I want to be right on time. I don't want to be late, but I don't want to be early. But football, you're like, I want to get there early, all right? And then you tailgate and you eat together, oftentimes with total strangers. You're just like looking for somebody who's wearing the same, same shirt as you, which is also weird, okay? Because in every other aspect in life, if you see that you're wearing the same shirt as somebody else, you're like, I better go change. You know, that's kind of weird. But when it comes to football, you try, to wear the same shirt as other people. And if you're ever eating at a tailgate, you might have seen this happen, and there's other people that walk by with the same shirt that you have on, you invite them to eat with you. I've been at tailgate parties where I'm literally eating and talking with somebody that I've never met before. I have no idea who you are, but you're eating my food right now, and I love it, and I don't think anything about it. Like, that's that community of football. Like, there's just this mutual bond for the love of the sport, and during the game, you're high-fiving total strangers. You're hugging total strangers like we have behind me here at a Browns game. You know, I know these people are total strangers because this one guy's like, I don't know about this hug right now, right? You see this? One guy's just, he's in. He's totally in. The other guy's like, I don't know you, bro, but this is sort of okay, maybe, right? To outsiders, this may look strange, but if you're inside of this football community, you understand they were passionate about their, about the, the object of what they loved. And it brought them together in this mutual affection. I say all these silly illustrations because that's what's going on in our text today. In Acts chapter 2, this is what was happening in the first century community of Christ. They were so passionate about their faith. And they were devoted to it in such a way that fellowship was an essential ingredient that defined their daily life. You know, as we survey Acts chapter 2, this is a narrative that we have of the earliest New Testament church. So oftentimes we use these verses to serve as the original copy or the original mold. Now, you know what that means, right? If you're making a copy of something, if you've ever had this experience, if you want to make an exact replica, it's always better to have the original mold because a copy of a copy of a copy over time begins to distort the original image. But if you make the copy from the original mold every time, chances are you're more consistently going to have the correct product. And I think that's what we see in what a lot of Bible teachers and theologians while we flock to these chapters, is because this is sort of the original mold that we have of the church to see this biblical model that the church had at this early time. And then I think that we can then take that example forward to our time today and think, okay, which ingredients from that time can transfer to the church today. And it's a great time for us to even say, okay, which ingredients from the early church are present in our church today? And that's what we're going to do for a moment. And if you have your sheets there, you have this on there. And I encourage you to take some time to write some things down as we're talking. And if you don't have your sheet, you can look up here on the screen. But this is a T-chart. I use these a lot. 
I don't even know what a T chart means. It looks like a T. And on one side, there's one column, and on the other side of the T, there's another column. It's pretty, uh, pretty incredible, right? Pretty, pretty deep this morning, all right? T chart. But on one side, we have the early church, okay? These are the characteristics from Scripture, teaching, fellowship, breaking the bread, and prayers. Now, you take a, a chance on this, or not a chance, but you kind of participated with this a little bit, and I want you to carry over to the other side, to today's church, which characteristics would you say that our church today participates in. Now, as you're looking at these, I want to help you a little bit. Teaching, I think we get this pretty good in our church today. We have a lot of space carved out for teaching. Hopefully, this time right here is teaching. As we open up the scriptures and we explain the word of God, there's small group Bible studies that are happening. There's Sunday school classes before, you know, the tornado wiped our entire church out. You know, we had Sundays go every morning. We had Sunday night discipleship. We had these small groups. We, we really participated in teaching. We still get that a lot, I think. And then this next characteristic, fellowship. Can we carry this characteristic over to today's church? Well, let's go on for a moment because we're going to get into that one a little deeper. But breaking of bread, technically in this context, we think the breaking of bread literally means the Lord's Supper. In the very first verse. Later, it doesn't mean that. But in this particular area, in verse 42, it means... The Lord's Supper. So we would say that, yes, we consistently practice the Lord's Supper at First Baptist. I think we could carry that over. And then what about prayers? I think we make prayer a pretty essential component of our church. It's going to be our last characteristic that we cover because it's kind of like one of the finales, that prayer is such an important and vital part of who we are as a church. So as you're thinking carrying those things over, I think three of them are pretty easy. But when we come to fellowship, can we really take fellowship over? Do we really participate in fellowship like the early church? You may ask, well, what is even involved in fellowship? What does that even mean to be similar to the early church as it, as it is in relation to fellowship? We're in luck in verse 44 in our text. It begins to kind of explain what is meant by fellowship. And it's so unique that a lot of the characteristics that Luke used in Acts to describe these four ingredients, he focused a lot on fellowship. But look in verse 44, what does it say? And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, and breaking bread in their homes. Now, this is more like the meal that we would know of just eating today. They received their food with glad and generous hearts, having favor with all people. And of course, the Lord added to the number day by day those who were being saved. Now, as you see this description, think about some of the characteristics that we've seen in relation to fellowship. All who believe they were together, they had all things in common. They were selling their possessions to meet the needs of the community. Day by day, they were attending the temple together. They were worshiping, receiving teaching together. And then afterwards, they were going to their homes and sharing meals with one another. So now the question I have for you is what aspects, it's on your sheet as well, what aspects of fellowship from the early church are present in our church today? What aspects from the early church are present in our church today, and I went ahead and added this on the T-chart here, togetherness, all things in common, selling possessions to meet the needs of others, attending church together, and meals together in homes. You take some time. You be the judge on this. Which characteristics can we carry over to today's church? Which ingredients can we say that we participate in today? Do we have this koinonia, this fellowship that is so descriptive of the early church? Do we possess a togetherness? Do we have all things in common? Are we sacrificing to meet the needs of others? Do we have a desire to be with the community of Christ, to worship with our brothers and sisters, to be together as a body of Christ? Do we consistently share meals with one another in our homes? And this week, as I really began to think deeply on these things and really surveying the church today, I thought, man, out of all these characteristics, I don't know that we have fellowship the way that the early church had fellowship. And then it led me to think, why not? Why doesn't the church participate in fellowship like they did 
back in the day. And, and so I got you some, some space here. You can, you can go with me on this one as well. So what are some personal and cultural barriers that deter us from the, from the characteristic of biblical fellowship? Let me read that again because I obviously can't read very well. What are some personal and cultural barriers that deter us from the characteristic of biblical fellowship? And you may come up with your own, and that's okay. As I was surveying this, I thought, why, why don't we? Why aren't we participating in fellowship? And I thought, we're busy. How many could raise their hands on this one and say, man, we are busy people. Like to carve out a day is like, that's, I can't even understand how that could work. We are so preoccupied with the cares of the world that I think we don't have any time left to invest in areas like fellowship. And I think about it, like, what is the aim, do this sometime, what is the aim of our busyness? And if we actually achieve the goal of our busyness, is that even the goal that Christians should be striving for? If this is you, if you're in here and say, man, I just don't have any time. I don't have any time to carve out. There's no time that I have to participate in this idea of fellowship. Let me challenge you. Let me encourage you. Carve out some time. Make this a priority. It's going to take intentional effort to participate in the characteristic of fellowship. It will not happen naturally in your life. The world and the cares of the world will steal every bit of the time that you have. So take a moment. Carve out some of that time. Talk with your family on how you can participate in this area of fellowship. Maybe it is that we don't see the value in it. It just may not be that important to us. Last week, we talked a lot about individualism. Our culture is plagued by individualism. Maybe we don't even see like the necessary benefits of me fellowshipping with others, that we feel like, man, I can do this just fine. I can come on church on Sunday mornings, and the rest of the week, I can do this just me and my family. We got this. We don't see the importance of it. Maybe it's just, it just takes too much time and effort. Let me be honest with you. It's not easy to open up our homes. It's not easy to invite people into our lives. It's not easy to cook and prepare meals. It's not easy to, to invest in relationships. It takes intentional effort. Maybe you think my house is too small. My house is too dirty. How can I invite people in my life is too small? My life is too dirty. I don't, I don't want to invite anybody into my life or my home. But can I for a moment just share with you just a personal experience of the power of koinonia? the power of fellowship. When we moved to Dubai, if you can imagine being completely ripped from any sense of community, there was no community. We had no community, no fellowship. And so quickly, we began to learn that the only kind of fellowship that we were going to be able to have was to intentionally invest in the people of our church. We didn't have any friends. We didn't have any family. We didn't really have any social, like, things that we were a part of. So, so we had to begin to reach out to people in our church because we were desperate for community. Like when solitary confinement or in isolation, we begin to crave community and fellowship. And this wasn't necessarily our characteristic before we moved to Dubai. I think we fit into the side of a lot of people in here and a lot of people in the church today. We were very busy. We both worked full-time jobs. We had kids that were involved in different things. And we didn't have time really to participate in fellowship like the scripture is trying to teach us this morning. We didn't have time to cook meals in our homes. We didn't have time to, to do activities with church members and to really invest heavily inside of people's lives. But here, removed from that, we finally had a chance to do this. And can I report to you on what we found? There's power in fellowship. As we stepped out, we saw this power. We experienced this power. This is how you begin to learn who people are. This is how you get to hear their stories. This is how you get to learn their personalities. This is by understanding the people, you begin to, to respect them more. You begin to care for them more. You begin to love them more. You begin to, to invest in them more. Before long, these people become just like family to where you care for their very soul. We saw that fellowship has the power to contribute to an incredible movement of God as, as believers gather together around a mutual understanding, a mutual affection in Christ Jesus. It changes your everyday life. 
You're continually thinking about these people, caring for these people. They're continually to spur you on to love and good works. There is power. I'm telling you, sure, there's power in community. But let me be honest with you, it wasn't easy. It would have been way easier just to cook meals for our family and then retreat to our rooms and watch a crime documentary because that's what we do for fun, I guess. I don't know. It's way easier to do that. It takes a lot more effort to actually prepare a meal for other people, to invite them into your homes and invest into these people. It takes time. It's, it, it takes intentionality. And it's not the easiest thing to do. But as we saw the benefits and the power of it, we begin to think it's okay. It's okay if it costs a little more for us. It's okay if it takes a little more of our time because we realized that we were no longer playing church. We were no longer just showing up on a Sunday morning. We were actually getting into the trenches with the people of the body of Christ. And it was a very special time to us. And as I come back to this area, that's one of the things that we desire, church. And it's one of the things that we want to impress upon you. So if you're out there and you're doing this, praise God, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the ones who only maybe just come here on Sunday mornings, and we, we don't want you to forsake this gathering. This is an incredibly important gathering that we would say never miss, okay? Obviously, you, I'm not saying never miss, okay? There's times that you miss, but I'm saying this is a very important time that we come together and we, we worship together and we break open God's Word and study it together. But I'm challenging you, open up your lives outside of this time. And there's certain things that I want you to be thinking about. What are some personal steps? Question four here. What are some personal steps that you can take to promote biblical fellowship? You can write some things down on your own, but some of the things I came up with is what we would like for you to do is commit to a small group. If you're not a part of a small group within our church, this is an incredible opportunity for fellowship. This is where you meet in somebody's homes or meet in a different location around our city and you're investing with a smaller group of people. In this time, you have time to talk with people. If we're honest, on Sunday mornings, we don't have a lot of time to really talk to other people, to really invest in other people well. It's just the format is not conducive to that. And so these small groups give this environment. Participate in church activities. Uh, throughout the summer, there's different activities. In the fall, we're going to be ramping up a lot of our church ministries, a lot of our church activities. Invest in these. Have opportunities to contact other church members. Invite someone to dinner. Go out and do an activity with a member of our church. Specifically, engage in church members outside of the Sunday morning time. Whatever this looks like for you, whatever the action steps, I would just encourage you to look to us because I think, church, this is what it means to be a church. We're not a worship service. Yes, worship service is a part of who we are as a church, but we're a church. We're a body of Christ who shares a mutual affection for one another. We are meant to be obedient to the one another's that we talked about last week in scripture. The one another's invest into one another, to hold others accountable, to encourage and spur on others to love and good works. We are designed and meant for each other. So I want us to experience the power of fellowship. In closing, if the musicians want to come, if anyone knew what it was like to be cut off from community, it was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer is one of my favorite authors. Bonhoeffer was a German, but due to his involvement with a plot to kill Hitler and his preaching of truth that was opposed to the Nazi regime, found himself in prison. He was ripped, completely ripped from this Christian community. If you know the story, Bonhoeffer never escaped from this prison. And he was end up, uh, he was uh, hung for his involvement with this plot to kill Hitler, and he was executed. But before his death, he was able to record his thoughts, and these thoughts became books. And these books were highly influential books for the people of Germany at that time. And even today, that's why that so many people read Dietrich Bonhoeffer, because of just the environment that he was in and what he wrote about was so real. And it affected the church in such a powerful way that we today, even in seminaries and all throughout the Christian world, we look to his writings and just to try to glean what he understood during this time. And in one of the books that Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote, it was a book called Life Together. I want to end our time with this statement that he said. He said, the physical presence of other Christians is a source of incomparable joy and strength to the believer. 
incomparable joy and strength. It's for those two reasons, church, that I impress upon you this characteristic of fellowship. I want you to experience joy. And I want you to experience the strength that comes from one another. So let me ask you this question again, church. How can you increase our church's health in relation to biblical fellowship?